Welcome to um, Young Arts Campus, National Young Arts Foundation, and on behalf of our chair, Sarah Arison, our board of trustees, and our CEO and president, Carolina garcia Jiram, and we are delighted to have you here for this event today to talk about um, urban planning and livable Miami. We're very happy to host the distinguished panel of urban planning experts to talk about uh, connectivity in Miami. And then also, we are also very proud of one of our own, uh, Deja Carrington, who will be presenting on her project with the Public Space Challenge uh, as well. So with that, I'm going to be introducing Matthew Beatty, who is Senior Director of Communications from the Miami Foundation. Uh, we'll read his short the bio here. He leads and manages the foundation's communications strategies and ensures that all efforts are integrated and reflect the organization's message. He also grows relationships throughout the community that increase the foundation's brand awareness. Uh, native Miamian Matthew attended the Cushman School, where he now serves on the Board of Trustees. Uh, Ransom Everglades School and earned a Bachelor of Science in Management and MBA in Marketing from Florida A&M. His public relations career includes managing outreach for Baptist Health, South Florida, the Port Miami Tunnel, the National Environmental Education Foundation, and numerous other organizations across the U.S. So uh, let's put your hands together. Let's uh, welcome Matthew to Young Arts. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Good afternoon. So what is this? Anybody know what that's a picture from? Who said that? I heard it. Biscayne Green. Biscayne Green. Now, what did this used to be? I heard it again. Parking lot. Parking lot. And I <laughs> and I saw a parking lot. Those are pretty synonymous. Uh, so a couple of years ago, as downtown continued to evolve into a neighborhood, the DDA realized that this space had greater opportunity than it was currently being utilized at. And they submitted an idea to the Public Space Challenge to create Biscayne Green, which turned that parking lot under the Metro Mover there into an activated green space that included food trucks and movie showings and dog parks and all manner of reasons for people to get out of their condos downtown and actually come and connect with the fellow members of their community. The result, as you can see, was incredibly successful. And it shows that there is a demand for these kinds of spaces and these kinds of activations in a community which was starving for them. And so, it was the Miami Foundation and the Public Space Challenge that provided the platform for the Downtown Development Authority to re-envision what Greater Miami could be. And that's what the Public Space Challenge is, is all about. It's all about working with residents in the Greater Miami um, region and within the county to really create the type of place that they want to live in. It's not about this top-down approach to placemaking. It's grassroots, bottom-up, you setting the vision for your own community. That's broadly what we do at the Miami Foundation. Now, after 51 years, we've worked with over 1,000 donors and partners and civic leaders and passionate Miamians just to give them a platform to be champions for the issues that they care about. A couple of years ago, we started down this path of public spaces being a tool to build community in Miami because of the benefits that these spaces provide to residents. Um, everything from health outcomes, those who live within walking distance of a good green public space um, by, by st statistically have a greater chance of living a healthier lifestyle. Safety outcomes which is an important conversation right now, um, thinking about uh, gun safety and, and gun violence in neighborhoods and how public spaces can provide programming that provide alternatives to lives, uh, lives of violence. And then finally, livability and vibrancy, which is a community that is connected and exciting to live in, um, not to mention resiliency, 
These green spaces can actually be solutions to systemic issues like sea level rise by giving the water a place to go rather than trying to fight it as we encounter sea level rise here um, in greater Miami. So the point is that investing in these spaces is not just for the folks downtown or the folks in South Dade, that it benefits everyone across greater Miami and improves the community that we live in. So what's next? That's what this year's Public Space Challenge is all about. We've seen the success of Biscayne Green. We've seen the impact of the underline. We envision the impact of Plan Z and the Ludlam Trail. But what is the next public space that can transform a neighborhood in Greater Miami? And that's what anyone and everyone in this room can tell us by going to publicspacechallenge.org, answering two quick questions, and letting us know your idea to improve, activate, or create a public space. Along with our partner, Target, who is investing in ideas that promote healthy lifestyles, we're going to give away $305,000 to make these ideas a reality. So these are real resources that anyone can use, a group, a church, a neighborhood association, a for-profit company, a nonprofit, an individual, anyone can win. So today, hopefully, you'll glean some ideas about how you can use public spaces to further activate our local neighborhoods. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Marta Viciedo, who is the founding partner of Urban Impact Lab. I've had the pleasure of working with Marta now for a number of years. She is a close, close friend of the Miami Foundation and myself. Uh, she is a graduate of our Miami Fellows Leadership Program. Uh, she is also a past Public Space Challenge winner herself and works with um, Urban Impact Lab to, to create civic solutions to issues that we face here in Miami and abroad. She's a current consultant on the, Miami, on, uh, the Public Space Challenge and a pleasure to work with and glean insight from. So without further ado, Ms. Marta Viciedo. Hi there. Um, it is my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Matt, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I hope that I could like, live up to half of that. Um, it is really my pleasure to be here. Thank you to Young Arts for, for hosting this. Um, and thank you for all the people that worked so hard to put this together. Um, our organization, Urban Impact Lab, has had the incredibly good fortune of sharing a passion for this city um, that many of you share, and certainly the Miami Foundation and Matt just talked about. We see the potential that Miami has and what it can be. Uh, we see the people that are here every day building it, you'll get a chance to meet two specific people in a, in a little bit that have actually been challenge, public space challenge winners in the past and have they work every single day to make this city better. Um, but just looking out in the crowd, I see a few familiar faces of other people that are doing this regularly and I'm so humbled to be here in your presence because the work that you all are do, you all do uh, inspires us to keep moving forward. Um, in addition to, to helping with the Public Space Challenge, our organization does some work around resilience and transportation. We love getting involved on the ground, getting our hands dirty and building things. Uh, and then we also do a little bit of policy work to help make sure that those projects are able to move forward sustainably. Um, but with that, I actually have an immense, uh, I'm just honored to introduce to you Gil Peñaloza. Um, he is not only somebody that's going to enlighten you with uh, lots of public space challenge and, 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 and really important things about the city, but he's also been a mentor to us at Urban Impact Lab um, in his 880 Cities effort. So Gil Peñaloza is the founder of 880 Cities and is passionate about cities for all people. He advises decision makers and communities on how to create vibrant cities and healthy communities and focuses on the design and use of parks, streets, um, sorry, parks and streets as great public spaces, as well as sustainable mobility, walking, riding bicycles, using public transit, and the new use of cars. Gil has been a strong supporter and advocate for improving city parks, 
first making his mark in the late 1990s when he led the transformation of Bogota's park system as commissioner. During his tenure, Gill successfully led the design and development of hundreds of parks, including Simon Bolivar, a 113 hectare park in the heart of the city. Gill's team also led the new Ciclovia. Are all of you familiar with Ciclovia? Wonderful. Uh, so he led the development of the new Ciclovia slash open streets. It's a program that sees over one and a half million people. One and a half million people. That's, a, that's bigger than the city of Miami. Uh, they, people come out, walk, they run, they skate, and they bike along 76 miles of Bogota's city streets every Sunday. And today, he is internationally recognized and emulated, uh, or rather, the, 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 as well as the Ciclovia. Gill is the chair of the Board of World Urban Parks, the international representative body for the city parks, open space, and recreation sector. I just want to pause for a minute and, and um, help bring that point home of a Ciclovia that runs 76 miles and brings out one and a half million people on a weekly basis in a city. Uh, an idea like that, what could that spur here? Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Gil Peñaloza and he's going to inspire you and give you all the information on how to make that happen here. Thank you. It's so fantastic, the program of getting, but you, you should change the area code so that is not $305,000 but maybe what if you had a, a record of 980, 980,000? <laughs> but what a great idea because it's about that. It's about improving the public spaces. So today, I want to talk about sustainable mobility. And of course, we're going to talk about parks and cities and how it changes. You know, cities are so different. By the way, cities, some cities might be 10,000 people or might be a million or 10 million are the same issues. Different solutions, but in a city of 10,000 people, if you're under 16, you don't drive. In the city of 10 million, if you're under 16, you don't drive either. In the city of 10,000, you are living longer. And in the city of 10 million, you are also living longer. You, so you might have different solutions for mobility. In the 10,000, you might need three buses. In 10 million, you might need a light rail. Uh, but in both, you're have, we're having climate change, even if some people don't want to believe in it. <laughs> We're having population growth, and all of it is in the cities, in the areas. Almost nine out of 10 people in the US live in cities. And we're having public health crisis. We're living longer. This is exciting, living longer. You know, 200 years ago, this is the life expectancy. All of these are the countries in the world. 200 years ago, we didn't have any country living where the life expectancy was over 45. Today we don't have any where the life expectancy is below 45. Imagine this gigantic change. We've been around for around 200,000 years. So in 200,000 years, we came up to here. And in only 200, we're here. But in many ways, we're facing an urgency. Because one of the things, 200, 100 years ago, what people were dying of was lack of water, clean water and sewage, and vaccination. But what people are dying of today is lifestyle-related issues, heart attacks, respiratory problems, depression, anxiety. So we need to improve the, our built environment. We need to improve our cities. So, I'm not, so how do we want to live? And when I'm talking about sustainable mobility, I'm talking about walking and riding bicycles and new uses of cars. And when I'm talking about walking and cycling, please, it's not a joke. Uh, this, is, this could be any community in Miami. And people say, oh, Gil, but it's hot. You know, the weather and the humidity. Weather is always an excuse. People say there's no such thing as bad weather. It's bad clothing. <laughs> we got to change the clothing. Yesterday, I was speaking at the commissioners of the Miami-Dade County. And it seemed like if I was at the commissioners of London, England, People dressed really bored, dark suits, they were suffocated. Said, my God, God gave you, God was so generous with Miami that gave you wonderful weather. Dress up, get rid of the ties. Don't expect people to wear high heels. I mean, if you want to wear high heels, fine. If you want to wear ties, fine. But you should not be expected. 
Those people with dark gray suits and ties, they're not taking public transit. They're not even walking two blocks to get a coffee. So we need with them to do it. And so walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Walking and cycling is the all individual mode of mobility for most people. Even in the wealthiest neighborhood of, of Miami, more than one, uh, one, one out of three people do not drive. It's the only individual mode of mobility for all children and youth. So being able to walk or bike safe and enjoyable should be almost like a human right. Unless you think that only those that have the money and the age and the desire to drive a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why this afternoon we're also talking about democracy and human rights and equality and sustainability. Because everything is linked to everything. And we're going to also talk about parks and public spaces. And let's open our mind what parks and public places mean. Because you know, I was working a few months ago in Poland. And I saw these sculptures, and someone thought it was winter, so someone thought they were getting cold, so he lent them the scarf. You know, the public space is kind of magical. The children see these little people pushing the ball, and they come and they want to help. We are revitalized in cities, Detroit, the downtown, through it. Sometimes it's in the middle of the city, like Piedmont, or along the Highline Park or along the Mississippi River. And we do so many things in parks. I was working in Chicago during the, four years ago and during the World Soccer Cup. I went to the parks to watch games and that's what they were doing in South Korea and in Bogota and Germany. But again, parks and public places are so great. It's not just for sports or, or political issues, the umbrella revolution. Went to the parks, Occupy Wall Street. They went to the parks and public places. Yes, we shall live in Paris. You know, the beauty of the public space is that it's a great equalizer. We are all equal. No one knows here who's rich, who's poor, who's fat, who's skinny. Everybody's the same. And again, it's not just politics. Here we got two million people in Rio. But it wasn't even the World Cup. The Pope came and gave a mass for two million people. But again, it doesn't have to be big. It can be small. And look with the... Miami Foundation and the challenge, you can do this. This is a stairs. This guy in Rio, this is less than $25,000. But also, take advantage. Whatever you're going to do in the public space in this challenge, make sure that it has an effect. It's not, this can be a means to something else, improving the community. Even can be very simple. Look at this, 130 steps. You get 130 families, and each one paints one step and puts their initial on the step. Imagine the level of sense of belonging to that neighborhood, or if it's small businesses. So this, there are many examples of challenges that you can do. I mean, the public space is kind of magical, and a big public place is called streets. Streets. When we look at the cities from the air, the biggest public space, public is that belongs to all of us. Public are the streets, are between 25 and 40% of our city. Miami, probably around 35%. 35% of Miami are streets. They belong to all of us. Whether you drive or don't drive or walk or bike or rich or poor, whatever, that is a public space. Of the things that belong to all of us, the streets are between 70 and 90% of those. And it's just not about sustainable mobility or parks. When we're talking about public spaces and the challenge, think of the benefits. That those challenges are going to be good for the culture. Maybe it gets people doing art, doing movies, bringing festivals. It's good for education, getting the schools to be part of it. Recreation is good for the environment, for transportation, for health, physical, mental, emotional. It's going to be good for economic development. Think that when people ask me, Gil, what's a good city? I said, a good city is probably where I want to sleep at home, but I want to live outside. And this challenge is going to help with that. That's why I'm really very thankful for Knight Foundation for organizing all of these talks with the Miami Downtown Development Authority, but also the two foundations, the Young Arts and the Miami Foundation. So today, I'm going to be talking about vibrant cities and healthy communities and happier people. I'm going to put emphasis on equity and public health. To put things into context, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bogota and ADD cities, but I'm going to end with four messages. We all agree with the agenda? It's okay? Okay. 
Bogota. Obviously, Bogota is not the ideal city. But in my previous life, I was commissioner, and I learned that things are not about the money. Don't let anybody tell you about the money, because if politicians tell you they don't do bikeways, or they don't do linear parks, or they don't do public transit because of the money, that's a lie. It's because, because you go two blocks away, and they're widening roads, they're doing elevated highways. It's an issue of priorities. Also, I've been doing. And when I do things, I find a lot of cave people. You probably see a lot of cave people around Miami. The citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> but that's why you are part of the challenge and many other things. Don't take no for an answer. We need to become champions at finding solutions to the problems, not at finding problems to the solution. Don't take no for an answer. We did many things. For example, this is a linear park across the city. Earlier this morning, I met with some of the people that are doing linear parks here, like the underline. I really don't get how is it that you cannot get funding in a wealthy city like Miami to do a 10 mile linear trail that is gonna be good for everything. We did this one 18 miles across the city and went all over the place. By the way, people kept saying, someone said this morning, oh, but it's so easy because in Bogota, the mayor's strong. No, 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 it's never easy. Anywhere. People tend to think that the grass is greener. Here, when we was having a public meeting, we started in one of the wealthiest parts of the city and ended in one of the poorest. That's why I like linear parks, they connect. But we had a public meeting and one of the wealthiest person in this in the not in the city, in the country, said, Oh Gil, we don't want any playgrounds. And I said, What do you mean? Don't you have children? And they said, Oh yeah, but they don't play in the parks. I said, What do they play? Oh, they play in the country club. I was so upset, you know why? Because we were gonna build a really nice area for people that sell flowers. So what these wealthy people didn't want were the grandchildren or the children of these people bring a plane in their park. So I was so upset that I said, look, you didn't want one playground, I'm gonna do three of them. And I got out and I left, I was really upset. Things are hard everywhere. Everywhere, but look at this. We did separating pedestrians and cyclists, the kind of lights, and organizing restaurants and wayfinding, and always crossing the city. We went all over the city, the wealthy part, the middle areas, and we ended up in one of the poorest parts of the city. This was before and this was after, with a linear park all around it and lots of neighborhood parks. Look at the level of poverty. It was not even paved roads. And people say, why do parks in the where the poor, poor people live? Well, where the poor people feel miserable is in the leisure time, in the leisure. When they are working, the CEO of the bank or the minimum wage worker, similar experience. Maybe the CEO has more anxiety. But in the leisure time, the CEO has country clubs and theater and restaurants and plays and art and travels. The minimum wage worker doesn't. So if we improve, the use of the leisure time, we're going to improve the quality of life. We also did this, Ciclovia. There was a program with just a few thousand people and a small one, and we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. So in the mornings, we pop it up, and people come out and walk and bike and skate. How do we do it? It's really simple. Do it in Miami. Open streets to people, close into cars, and the magic happens. Miami would be ideal. It's pretty flat. W magnificent weather all year round. Why did we do 75 miles? Because why, I wanted to make sure that we would interconnect the whole city, the wealthy neighbors, the poor neighbors, the middle class neighbors, so that people would meet each other as equals. It doesn't make any sense that some parts of Miami, if you happen to be born there, your life expectancy is gonna be 15 or 20 years more than if you are born two miles away. And they don't really know each other. So let's have a cyclovia that goes right through both so that they get to know each other. Maybe they say, oh, you know, these are not that bad people. Let's, let's see how can we work together and also how to interconnect the parks and how to make the connectivity. And people walk and bike and skate and along the routes also in the parks we do aerobics and tai chi, but everything is around physical activity. We get young, old, fat, skinny, we get, we get 1.7 million. You know, this is not like the marathon. This is much more important than a marathon. I mean, I love marathons. I run now, not marathon, now we do halves. I do about seven per year. But you gotta be in shape to run 13 miles or to run 26. Here, 
It doesn't matter. You can come for five minutes, for 30 minutes, for three hours. You can walk and stop. It's for anybody. It changes minds. All of a sudden, it reminds us that the streets are public space. They, belong, they can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. Maybe the foundation should do another three or five and fund. Do it monthly. What is the risk? Get together with the mayors and everybody. There is no risk. Say, okay, during the next 12 months, we're going to do it the first Sunday of every month. At the end of the year, if it doesn't work, okay, then you don't do it again. You are not building an arena. You are not building gymnasiums. You are just using the streets, the public space. But if it works, then you say, okay, the second year, we're going to do it weekly. And it has become like a virus, but a positive virus. I mean, cities like Los Angeles, the city of angels and car is doing it monthly, and they want to go weekly. Or Portland, or San Jose, or uh, Toronto, New York, so many, Paris. What do they have that Miami doesn't have? And their weather is horrible. Paris has its 52 weeks of the year, and Paris is cold in the winter, and it's hot in the summer. And they do, it's about social integration, everybody getting together. It's about connectivity, connectivity of, of neighborhoods, of retail, of minds, of people, of ethnicities. We meet each other as equal, and that is very powerful. But now I lead two organizations, World Urban Parks and 880 Cities. And I usually tweet about all of these topics. And I've been so lucky to have worked in over 300 different cities. If you want to know more about World Urban Parks, that is the website, worldurbanparks.org. But everywhere I go, people say, Gil, what's 880 Cities? Well, 880 Cities is not really about walking or cycling or parks, or streets, or sidewalks. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we help create some vibrant cities where we're going to have healthy communities and where people are going to be happier. And always people say, Gil, is this intersection safe? Can my children walk to school? Can my grandparents walk to the park or to take public transit? Look, you don't need to be a transportation engineer. Three simple steps. We call it ADD, rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Step number one, become an eight-year-old that you love, your son, your daughter, your grandchild, someone you love. Step number two, think of an 80-year-old that you love, your parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters. And when you have the child and the older adult, then go to step number three. Would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to the park or to take transit or riding a bike to get milk or eggs? If you would, it's because it's safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not, and we got to do it better. What if everything that we did in Miami, everything, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the school, the library, the museum, everything had to be great for an 8 and an 80, not 8 to 80. It's 8 and 80 as an indicator species, because if it's good for the 8 and it's good for the 8, it's going to be good for everybody from 0 to over 100. We need to stop building the city as if everybody was 30-year-old and athletic and build cities for all. That is a simple but powerful concept. Last month, I was working in Salt Lake City in Utah. I went to 20 intersections, and I walked at my normal speed. I could not walk any of the 20 intersections in the time allowed by the crosswalk. And then someone is killed, and they said, oh, it's probably jaywalking. Oh, it's probably listening to music. No, the older adults are three times as many as the ones killed in intersections because there is not enough time to cross. But like Einstein said, we cannot solve the problem by using the same kind of thinking that we use when we created them. So I want to take you through four messages. The first one, we got a great opportunity in Miami. But part of the great opportunity is let's wake up, be bold, be ambitious. Because some people the other day told me, oh, Miami, they gave us an award for, I don't know, an award for what? But please tell anybody that if they love you, don't give you any awards. Because when they give you awards, then, I mean, any city gets awards as long as they apply to enough of them. But then people become reluctant to change. No, be ambitious. You can be as good as any city. I mean, if you want to compare, compare to cities that are worse than you, you can do a list of 1,000 cities in 10 minutes. But if you compare yourself with those, you are going to look like those. No, say which city of similar size and income which have the best education? Which has the best mobility or walking or cycling? Which has the best public transit? Which one is the best index of happiness? Which one has the best mental health, public health, and so on? 
benchmark with those. You get a great opportunity in the US, we're gonna grow by around 120 million in the next 40 years. So we're gonna have to build around 40, 50 million homes here in Miami-Dade County. Today there's around 2.6, 2.7 million people. You are gonna go to 3.8. Imagine, 3.8, that's 1.2 million. I mean, go to the University of Miami and tell them, or FIU. In the lifetime of the students at FIU, it's gonna grow by about half. Imagine you had a magic wand, and you could redo half of Miami, even the best half. You would do it better. Well, that's the opportunity that you have. That's, that's why I also say a huge responsibility, because whatever we do or don't do is how people are gonna live for hundreds of years. And whatever we have done in the last 40 has not been very nice. We've been focusing on cars, 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 and not on people's happiness. And this is the kind of city that we have been building. There is no city the size of Miami in the world that has solved the issue of mobility through the private car. None. If that was a possibility, we would have hundreds of examples. The reality is we don't have any. And actually, when you are going to grow by 50%, so your traffic jam is going to grow m much more than that. It's a, this is horrible. And now the emerging economies, China, Russia, Brazil, they're doing exactly the same thing. This is Florence, Italy, and one highway intersection at the same scale. What kind of cities are we building? The cities do not decide the population growth. That's at the national level. But the cities do decide how to grow. Is this how you want to grow? When you increase by 50% the population of Miami-Dade, that children would be kind of slaves to someone who has a car just because they want to have an ice cream. So the last 40 have been really bad. So we got to improve the cities that we have today. We got to create great cities for this people. We got to change. And change is hard. That's why we don't change. Sometimes people get elected, and the number one priority, the date they get reelected is how to get reelected four years from now. And the easiest way to get reelected, do more of the same. Don't rock the boat. That's why they don't change. Maybe they want to do it better. But it's not about doing it better. We need to do things right, obviously. But that's not enough. We also need to do the right things. Let me explain. If we do a road and we don't have sidewalks, if we do it right, it's doing the same road without sidewalks, maybe we do it faster or doing it cheaper. No, we need to do it right. But we also need to do the right thing. Is do the road with sidewalks, with trees, with benches. And we do the same because the same is easier. How do we change? This is how we change. This is how we change. These Florida kids are magnificent. Whether you like their idea or not, but this is how change happens. When people say in Copenhagen, everybody bikes. It wasn't that easy. It's not because they have something instead of blood running through their veins, no. It's because they went through the oil crisis of the 70s and they started biking and a lot of people were being dead because they were not a good infrastructure. This is Amsterdam, all of these dying, and the papers worried with the amount of children being killed, and this is Copenhagen. So they started building bikeways that separated cyclists from cars in 1982, and look what has happened with the cyclists. So now they bike happy. So when you're gonna change here in Miami, three recommendations. First, change is not unanimous. Never. There will always be concerns. Second, the general interest must prevail over the particular. I'm not saying the majority, no, the general interest. You might have people on wheelchairs and you say, oh, I don't care about them, they're only half a percent. No, the general interest that we should take care of the most vulnerable, including people on wheelchairs. So the general interest must be prevail over particular. And three is when you say no to something, you're also saying yes to something else. You say, oh, we don't want parks, we don't want trees. Look, Miami could be so much greener. Here, you eat an, an, an orange, you spit the pit, and a couple of months later, a tree is coming up. <laughs> Fantastic weather, it should be so much greener. Miami should be like Singapore in the green. Second, we gotta have great parks. Something that we need is better management in the parks. Management is not maintenance. Maintenance is 20% of management, picking up the garbage and cutting the grass. Management is having activities, older adults doing bread with their grandchildren. Management is having uses and activities, walking and cycling and running and playing chess and having lunch. Management is having volunteers, but giving the tools. Management is asking the citizens when you're gonna do something, asking before, during, after. It's having human financial resources. It's having safety. But not like in London and they put a sign on the park, beware of the thieves. 
This is an open invitation to the thieves of the city. This must be a good market. No, you need a lot of police when the public space is empty. That's why also you need the challenge because when you got people, it's great. What is the best, the cheapest security in the public space? Uses and activities, uses and activities. So you gotta come up with uses and activities. Sometimes it's equitable access. We also gotta have good parks in the winter, in the summer, all year round. Even simple things such as a walking path. Every single park must have a walking path. The best cost benefit of any facility on a park is a walking path. It can be four miles in a large park, but it could be just quarter of a mile in a small one in front of a library. And you put up different color, nice texture, so we got to do these things, all, all kinds of activities. Maybe even do some laughing yoga. That is good for everything. So we have large parks or small ones in Miami. Actually, we got to do both because they satisfy different needs. The small neighborhood park, we develop a sense of community. We meet our neighbors. We have solidarity, but we're not going to be able to play soccer or baseball, so we got to have the medium-sized parks. And we're not going to be able to go canoeing, so we need the big ones. We need all of them, small, medium, large. We need active, passive, contemplative recreation. We also gotta have sustainable mobility. Who came walking today? One, two, two and a half. Everybody came walking. I don't see any cars in this room. I don't see any bicycles. Every single trip to the park and everywhere begins walking. Walk, we walk to the car, we walk to public transit, we walk to places. Also, that's how we were created, just like the birds fly or the fish swim and the deer runs. People, we walk, and we are so happy when we're walking because we're walking and we use all our senses. We see the birds, and we also hear the children when they are around, and we smell the aroma of a coffee. And, we, you know, we just walk in the summer, we walk in the winter, but we got to make it safe. Yesterday, people driving cars killed. People, not cars. People driving cars killed 741 people. That's more than a person every two minutes. They're not accidents. Accidents when they could not be avoided. These could have been avoided. There are incidents. We gotta have vision zero in every city. Many cities across the US are getting into this, saying people are not perfect, so we need to build roads based on that. Miami should be part of vision zero. You know, Florida, is the state with the highest index of pedestrians and cyclists killed by people driving. The highest. Of the 15 worst cities in the US, 11 are in Florida. And that's the 15, that is the last place in the country that is probably the worst in the developed world. Miami should say, no, we're gonna do better. We don't care what California is doing, we don't care what Oregon, we don't care. No, we are going to be the safest. We're, we're going to make create such an impact that we're going to go from the worst to the best. And we're going to do it in five years. Why not? Are we going to allow the carnage to continue indefinitely? We're going to make pedestrians a priority. This is not a priority. And I went running on Sunday and I took some photos. This is here in Miami. This is not Miami, but we should not allow cars to go on the sidewalks. You know, it's all some places that we don't even do sidewalks. We are telling this person, you are a second class citizen when we don't even do sidewalks. If we're going to improve walkability, we got to lower the speed everywhere. All residential areas. In the arterials, it can be 40 or 50. In the residential, as soon as you turn into a residential, 20 miles an hour. Do it. Why? Because a lot more people are going to walk. And walk, walking is like the magic medicine. You walk and it's good for the depression, for the anxiety, for muscles, for the heart, for osteoporosis, for Alzheimer's, for everything. So we gotta make it really, really easy to walk. And we don't like walking with the cars are going at 40 or 50 miles. We like walking with the cars are going slow. Also because if a car, if a driver hits you at, five, at 20 miles an hour, 5% probability of being killed. If it hits you at 40, it's gonna be 80%. And there are many, many stories that show exactly the same. So we, I mean, Seattle last year lowered the speed limit to 20 miles to 2,400 miles of streets. So if Seattle can do it, why not Miami? Because we keep saying, oh no, it's because the mayor is strong here, it's because those people are so and so there. No, Seattle is doing it, New York is doing it. How about Miami? 
If we don't put an, an island in the crosswalk, we could eliminate half of the incidents. Why are we still doing crosswalk without an island when we know that it's gonna save lives? So oh, none of this is technical, none of this is financial, all of this is political, it's doable. We are, and sustainable mobility is not just walking, also riding bikes, using public transit, new uses of cars. I'm not saying this is the end of the car industry, but the way we use cars is changing very fast. Fortunately, the young people in the US are saying, you know, the car is not a status symbol. The young people, the car, in their mind, is something like huge traffic jams and noise and pollution. Actually, it's becoming more of a status symbol not to have a car. And say, you know what? I live in a walkable neighborhood, and I have a walk score of 92, and I don't need a car. I mean, if we define our seat around cars, all we're gonna get is more cars. And then we gotta invite our friends to help us cross the street. <laughs> and then what do we do? We build more roads. You know, trying to solve mobility through widening roads or building roads is like trying to put out a fire using gasoline. <laughs> it doesn't work. But if we define Miami around people, we're going to get healthier and happier people. And that's the idea. And the new uses of cars. People talk about the driverless cars to end congestion. Not the congestion are not the drivers. The congestions are the cars. We need to change, we need to drive less, we need to design better cities. I mean, if we don't change, this is how cities look like without driverless cars, and this is how they're gonna look like with driverless cars. There's not gonna be any change. So, and we're gonna ride bicycles. Imagine going to school in Miami. This is, it will be so much fun and exciting, or people going shopping. I mean, when you're gonna do cycling, benchmark with Copenhagen. Miami could be as good or better than Copenhagen. The weather there is horrible, it rains all the time. It's cold in the winter. 41% use their bikes as a mode of transportation and they are not saying, oh, we're not, we're gonna go to 50. And they are moving in that direction. They are continuing to improve their facilities. All of the arterials, all have protected bike. We at one level for the bike, three inches higher for bikes, three inches higher for pedestrians. And they're building new infrastructure. They was built for three or four years ago. Measure when I took this photo, 16,000 cyclists had gone by with lots of snow. So it's not for the 20 to 15 spandex, it's for everybody. So we gotta think, and it's not just the roads. Also, you have some ideas of plans to do trails. Do them. They also have them in Copenhagen. They use a lot of trails, which are nice. And when people say, oh, but these are those for recreation or for transportation? <laughs> Don't worry about the little details. Of course, it's for both. Sometimes you're gonna use it for recreation. Other times you're gonna use it for transportation. So you don't have to brand it one way or the other. And this is great. Many possibilities. And I found someone that could be your ally transforming a lot of this. She's having a baby this week, I hear. Has she had a baby? Anyone knows? Oh. She had? They went, we took him biking all over Copenhagen. You know, the only thing that gets people cycling is to lower the speed in the residential areas and to create a network of protected bikeways. A AAA, what's AAA? All ages and abilities. All ages, we are a thing of the daytime and nighttime and, and people that are experts and people that are not. And if you don't have the political decision or the money to do it permanent, do it temporary. But don't just paint the line. If you have, the difficult thing is to get the space. So if the politicians say, we're gonna give the space to the cyclists, enhance that painted line. And that is gonna create a world of difference. You do this for the cars already. I saw here in Miami, they were, so you don't, you separate cars because, so that they don't hit each other, separate cars from cyclists as well. So that the cars won't be hitting the cyclists and do agree, it's not just about one. Nothing as important as connectivity. Like, like we have a, wa a, a water grid or a power grid, we got a bicycle grid. And also we gotta improve public transit. My brother is the mayor of Bogota and he says that civilized communities not where the poor have cars, is the where the rich use public transit. You need to do much better public transit in Miami. Smart is a good idea, but it has to go from talking to doing. It has to go from a vision to action. And sometimes people say, oh, Gil, but we need infrastructure. Well, you got the infrastructure, let me do a mobility math. It's not that hard. <laughs> Are you gonna have one of these or 140 of those? Are you gonna have one of those or 145 of those? It's, 
already one third of Miami are streets. Do we want it to be 45, 55, 80%? Is this, you know, it's nice. I see some changes that are interesting. This used to be a, a, a railroad elevated because they were bringing chemicals into New York and they were gonna tear it apart and the citizens and the city got together and said, no, 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 let's not tear it down, let's do a park. And they did the Highline Park. So this is interesting. This is part of mobility as well. This is part of sustainable mobility and also part of recreation, about tourism, about economic development, about vibrancy. When people tell you cities don't change, they do change. Melbourne used to be horrible. Even they made fun of themselves, an empty, useless city center. It has similar weather to Miami or even warmer. And they put public cars all over the place, not for the cars at 60 miles, but for the people at three miles an hour. They planted trees. And a, a street without trees and with trees is totally different. The trees are great for the environment and for health and for business and for walking and for everything, improving public spaces. They also had like a river right through the middle of the city. All of these are part of the laneways. They had all factories around and they changed it. In Miami, imagine your river with a linear park on both sides and with beautiful walking uh, bridges. It's, an, it's a political issue. Are you gonna have a city that you want it to be this vibrant and exciting? Look, from the point of view of the challenge, I got five minutes, the challenge. I, I saw this beautiful uh, street furniture and I said, do you charge rent a lot of money? They said, no, it's not about that. Let's dignify the people that use our public space, whether they are doing shoe shining or doing flowers or whatever. They said, more important, we invite them and we tell them, look, you are gonna use a space that belongs to you to your parents, to your children, to your neighbors, to your friends, it's the public space. So it's even more important. So instead of charging you a thousand dollars, we're gonna charge only a hundred, but you gotta keep all of this area clean. Number two, if you see anything wrong, drug addicts or what, you gotta call us. Don't get involved, call us. But more important, the time. They say, you gotta open Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you gotta open at 7 a.m. and close no earlier than 8 p.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they're gonna be open 24 hours. Why 24 hours? Because it, when you are walking, you go to a restaurant, you go to a bar, whatever, you come out at two o'clock in the morning, and you feel safe because in this street, they're selling flowers. In the next one, fruits and vegetables. In the snack, they're not gonna sell a lot of money at three o'clock in the morning. But citizens will feel safe because they know there is a person, lots of lights, an alarm, a telephone. So it's a win-win. It's good for the city, it's win good for them. This is at noon. This is at 7 p.m. This is at midnight. And these are the kind of things. But in the challenge, think also, how can you be creative? You know, no one wanted to live in downtown Melbourne. Now everybody wants to live. They love it. So everybody learns from everybody. This for the challenge, I added these couple of things. This, a friend, physical education teacher, she, she knew, saw that fewer and fewer kids were walking to school in a horrible weather. She said, why don't you walk to school? Because they were afraid of the cars. So when the kids went home on holidays, they came back from holidays and Anne was dressed up as a pylon. She shut down the parking lot. The kids had to be dropped off and the parents had to walk with the kids. And at minus 24 degrees, the kids started to walk and bike. We need hundreds of Anne Fentons because part of it is infrastructure, but part of it is programs. It's hardware and it's software. Cochrane. 5,000 people and two polar bears. I went there and I saw the week before I had been in Google, so I showed, was showing them some photos of the offices of Google and the restaurant where they give you everything for free. And of course, their self-driving car. That's why I was invited to take a look at this car. And when I was showing images and how they spend lunch and whatever, one of the things that someone in the audience liked was the bike, <laughs> the bike. So, a high school student. And the high school student went back to school and said, oh, my God, why don't we do a bike share system in a city of 5,300 people? They went to the police and they said, you got a lot of bicycles that are lost and found? Give them to us. They were broken. They fixed their bikes, they painted them like the Google bikes, and they created a bike share system. 85% of the citizens here have a bike within walking distance. So all of that improves the public space and the attitude and everything. I'm so happy that so many areas are moving, roads for cars are becoming places for people. Here there used to be a river going through here and they put a road, but they said, can we go to Miami to bring the best people? Probably not, so they took out the road seven years ago. 
I mean, you want to live in this city or in this one? So this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Are we going to do streets for cars, streets for people? Do we want our streets to look like car storage or actually to help build community? It's totally different if we got here six lanes of cars or if we got one and a half miles of linear park. It's about improving the quality of life. Here in Seoul, there used to be eight miles through the middle of a river. They put a road with six lanes. It got full. So what do they do? They did a second floor. It got full. So what did they do? They wanted a third floor. The mayor said, no, you know, we're not going to solve mobility. So he took down the second, the first, they brought out the river and created a linear park. And then people are going to say, oh, it's because in South Korea, the mayor is powerful. No, it was very difficult. People were saying, mayor, are you crazy? People are not going to stop for coffee. As if going at 60 miles an hour, anybody was going to stop for coffee. Now they stop for coffee because there's only two lanes. And this is a magnificent linear park of eight miles through the middle of the city. This is Madrid before and after. This is Portland. So Miami, do things. And lastly, let's become guardian angels of the gentle majority. The gentle majority are the children, the older adults, the poor. Miami, let's make children, let's make a playability everywhere. Again, for the challenge, put swings all over Miami. Make it a sound. In the bus stops, let's have a nice parklet. Or they assign another bus stop. It's about making a city fun and exciting for children. Look, it's not a lot of money. You don't need 25,000 for that. Maybe you can give some for 500. <laughs> Look at this. Make pedestrians visible. Make them show that they exist near the bus stops. And people are going to say, great, because the children is going to be fun for them. It's not because it's going to be fun. It's because for children, they learn. Plain. Plain is how they learn. That's why that's how they, 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 they develop their muscle strength, their sociability, their cognitive capacity to think, to learn languages, to concentrate to develop a sense of belonging. We gotta have playability in Miami everywhere. And this challenge is so fantastic because a lot of these could be swings. These gigantic swings are great and they have music and then at night it lights up all over the place. I mean, we gotta have a goal. Every kid in Miami should have a park or a player within walking distance or let's do art. So this challenge I think could be great. And don't think that children zero to 15 are the same. No, it's not the same, the three, the eight, the 13 year old. We are working with Urban 95. What is Urban 95? How does the city look like from the height of a healthy three-year-old? It's 95 centimeters. So let's work on that also because we need to have a city that is good for everybody. And part of that, and if, we, if, if you don't have parks, then let's think whatever becomes public. With the Knight Foundation, we're working really hard on how to make everything that is public linked. The library, the park, the school, the sidewalk, the street, everything. This is a typical school in America. No, turn it into this. Could be fantastic places. We gotta have school parks during the daytime for the school, at nighttime for the community. And if we don't have a school, let's take over a street and make it a play street. I mean, if every child is going to have a park, all of the adults as well. And we're living longer, so much longer. And she's thinking that I'm going over time. Yes, I am. Three minutes. I'll be, you know, we're living so much longer. You know, the people that have ever lived to 65 in the history of humanity, half are alive today. It's new. It's so exciting. Look at the U.S. used to have very few people over 65. And it's going to double, and the over 80 are going to quadruple. Miami-Dade County, you got 535,000 over 65. In 30 years, you're going to have almost a million. What kind of city do we have? Is it nice and enjoyable? And babe, the, the over 65, they're not takers. They're givers. They're fantastic. They're having fun and exciting. They're not thinking about retirement. They're thinking it's about retirement. We should create a movement of the 60 plus alive, because the biggest waste of resource that we have are the older adults. And maybe we should do in the challenge something good for all their adults because they're healthier and wealthier and more active. And they have experience and knowledge, but we are forgetting about them. They retire and we cross them out as if they had died, but they got 20, 30, 40 years. You know, there's a big gap between people retiring and people getting old. We used to think, oh, people retire and they're old. Or maybe sometimes people are old even before they retire. No, now there is a big gap. People retire and they have 20, 30 years before they actually become old. Universities, you have 30, 40% of the courses for all the adults that are hungry to learn. about. I mean, 100 years ago, the life expectancy in the US, sorry, 200, was 39. Today is over 80. We have learned how to survive, but we have so many issues that we need to learn how to live. 
And a lot of this is about the built environment. So let's improve the built environment. And let's think, older adults are not everyone with oxygen and, no. This is what people in their 60s look like. In their 70s. Elton John, just last night there was a really good program with Elton. Older adults in their 80s, in their 90s. Of course, there's also people on wheelchairs and walkers, and they can also be happy and fun and excited and have a really good life. They can be tutoring kids in the schools, teaching English to the immigrants. They could be organizing Tai Chi and yoga and dancing. And, and the poor, let's take care of the poor. I'm talking about equity, not equality. This is equality. No, someone, someone starting so far behind that someone need two and three boxes, others might not need any box. And someone said, this is equality, this is equity, this is reality. Really, really hard. Maybe in Miami we gotta think outside the box, maybe tear down the world, do things different. You know, the America is the wealthiest country in the world and has over 13 million children living in poverty. These are the wealthiest country in the world and the US has one out of five. Miami-Dade County, one out of three. One out of three children live in poverty. Can you do better? Of course, South Korea is one out of 16. Denmark is one out of 37. We gotta, it, they, mobility. Why so important? Because the people that have a car as a model of mobility spend a quarter of their salary on, in, on, on mobility. If people use public transit or walk or bike, it would be 5%. So there is nothing that the government could do that would improve the economic situation than allowing the houses to downsize from two cars to one or one to zero. And that would be great for the economy because that money would be spent in the local economy. We cannot accept that people in some parts of the city are going to have a life expectancy of 64 and 10 minutes away of 90. And it's not just because it's Cleveland. The same thing if you go to Washington, you go to New Orleans. Here in Miami-Dade, the life expectancy in Overtown or in other parts of the... Almost every community along the water has 16, 17, 18 years more than a lot of the communities inside. That, that doesn't make any sense. Let's not assume that that's normal. No, that is not normal. So how do we want to live? Let's think outside the box. None of these things are technical or financial. They are political with a big P. Everybody needs to participate. Everybody. Citizens can no longer be spectators. Let's build alliances. This is like a three-legged stool. One of the legs are the elected officials at the, at the city, at the county, at the state, at the national. Another leg is the public sector, but don't, not just planners. Involve public health and education and tourism and economic development. And the third is the community, the activists, the media, the NGOs. How do we get all three working together? What is the glue? It's the sense of urgency. Let's develop a sense of urgency. I mean, one out of three people in Miami is obese. One out of 10 has diabetes. One out of 10 is depressed. One out of three kids lives in poverty. I mean, there are so many things where you could pick as a sense of urgency and then develop a shared vision. How do you want the Miami to be, Miami-Dade County? And then action, act. Because some people do the vision, but then they don't act. So they become frustrated. They know what needs to be done, but they don't do it. Other communities act, but they have no vision. They, they are doing all, a little here, a little here, a little here. Like a Frankenstein, it's total chaos. But if you have a vision, if you have action, you can really create a great city for all. And then move from talking to doing. And you will say, oh, but we're doing. Of course you're doing, but you got to do more and you got to do it faster. Because it's really about creating a vibrant Miami with healthy communities where all people are going to live happier. So Miami, let's do it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was amazing. That was amazing. You you thought I was I, I I was just like yes yes. I was not looking at my clock. I was actually involved in my own head with what needs to happen. Um, so I think many of you probably um, realize just how on point uh, Gil's message is. Um, as our community right now is thinking about the smart plan that he brought up brought, brought up and figuring out how to build high um, uh, six different lanes, um, uh, corridors for transportation, for public transportation, we are simultaneously also considering, and as, uh, actually unfortunately moving forward, the expansion of the uh, 836, about one of our highways, and it will be right at and beyond the urban development boundary out west. That is tragic. 
that the fact that that is moving forward is actually tragic. Yes, there are people that are having a pain point. They are, they are stuck in their traffic for hours and hours, but the solution is not, as he so well quoted, um, the solution is not doing the same as what we've done before. Um, so uh, thank you so much for being here and thank you for, for so much attention to Gil. Right now, I have uh, more pleasure because I, I get to introduce all these wonderful people. I am going to introduce Deja Carrington. Um, Deja, is, she is the Vice President of External Relations and Communications, I got that right? Um, at the National Young Arts Foundation. She is a firm believer in providing valuable opportunities to emerging artists at pivotal stages in their careers and leads an exceptional team that offers programs, mentorship, financial support to the most promising artists throughout the country. I had the wonderful pleasure of working with Deja because um, she is also a previous Public Space Challenge winner. Um, her transformational project was called Newt. Um, and I'm going to let her talk about it quite a bit. Uh, but if you would join me in welcoming Deja, um, give you a little inspiration. There you go. Thank you, Marta. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Matt, the Miami Foundation, and my colleague, Matt. Um, as Marta mentioned, I applied to the Miami Foundation's Public Space Challenge before I became vice president here at Young Arts. But I've been doing this kind of work for a very, very long time. I've always been about equity and access to the arts. And so for me, the Public Space Challenge presented a unique, indiv uh, a unique opportunity to be in the space that I, wanted to, that I wanted to live in and that I wanted to share with my community. I often think about how can I create some kind of catalyst or some kind of intervention where people who would normally not be in touch with each other um, can all of a sudden have a conversation, right? Like, let's think about design to collide. Now, my project reimagined the skyline as a public space. But mind you, the skyline is made up of a lot of different public buildings. So for me, it was about looking at um, a light in the sky, a beacon of sorts, and of course, the dancing lady who finds herself on the Intercontinental Hotel um, seemed a prime target for that. So we'd like to play a little video for you, which more or less breaks down um, what the project looked like, its artistic integrity, and the concept uh, behind our um, behind the behind Newt. Miami is a city that's changing. World of innovation, artists, and design solutions that address urban challenges. We saw an opportunity to transform the central city building into a digital canvas for public art. The iconic Intercontinental Miami Hotel, a beacon on this same day, became our canvas with approximately 364 square feet, two facades, and 19 stories. mobile phones as one solution, so that audiences not only see the building, but can hear it as well. We wrote an original composition in synchronicity with the innovation, and with the Intercontinental centrally located on the bay, anyone with a view of the skyline could access the music on their phone. Our goal was to level the playing field by using everyday technology and connecting people from all different walks. We were inspired by Isaac Newton's idea that every color correlates to a musical note. Taking viewers to a higher sensory experience, Newton visualized the soundtrack of the installation. For you, the sky represents itself as a vertical stage with the power to reflect a socio-cultural shift. We knock on many organizations' doors to learn about their needs and have our project shine a light on their year-round programming and events. Museums, foundations, and developers open their spaces to us for off-site panel discussions and topical events. And 
organizations collaborated with us to explore a range of topics from women in technology to poetry, yoga, public spaces, and women. Throughout this process, we mobilized locals and tourists. We created a shared experience that gave people a sense of place and connectivity. So this is It was such an incredible experience. I mean, it started, and I'd like to share a little bit more about the, the inception idea, right? Um, the starting point. It started with me working a lot with Primary Projects Gallery, which back then was in downtown, not as developed as what it is now. This is pre-Frost. Um, this was just as um, the Freedom Tower was really kind of coming in its to an coming into its own with programming. And every day I would drive by the Intercontinental and the Dancing Lady. And for me, that Dancing Lady, does everybody know about the Dancing Lady I'm talking about? Let's just call her the Dancing Lady, OK? For me, that Dancing Lady was not in step with who we are. We are more, right? This is a cultural corridor for the arts, for innovation, for change, how can a skyline that's almost referred in, to in, in every film about Miami, right, be leading the conversation with a dancing lady? And I, I don't have anything wrong with dancing ladies, personally, but I just think that the conversation didn't have to be so monolithic. In other words, I wanted to change the conversation. So in so doing, we start thinking about how could we reimagine, right, this building to make a different kind of statement. Now, that building just happened to be right next to Bayfront Park, which was designed by Osamu Noguchi. And even before Art Basel came, he had the vision of Miami being this international place, right, where people from all walks of life would come to it. That's why there was the light tower. That's why there was that infamous fountain there. That's why we see so many different public sculptures in that space. So for me, there was just a real history in that park. And we felt there was real opportunity with that building. And you know, San Francisco does a really good job at rethinking um, private and public spaces. So for us, we weren't deterred by the thought that the Intercontinental is perhaps one of the world's largest hotel groups. For us, the fact that they're occupying such a large space on our skyline means that it's ours. And so we applied for the Awesome Foundation, a gateway grant of $1,000 that just helped us get buy-in, boost our confidence a little bit to apply for more. Then we applied to the DDA because it falls in their district and we, were, we got $2,500. And that kind of gave us proof of concept that people were listening. And that's when the public space challenge came about, right? And through the public space challenge, we got $11,000. And that did wonders in terms of covering the technology um, and the research that was required. But then we started a Kickstarter. And through that Kickstarter, we had 176 backers who gave over $10,000 to this project. That's what you call buy-in. And with that, we were able to get a lot of matching sponsorship. So the idea that you can have an idea, or the idea, the concept, that you can have an idea, or see an opportunity, or go into um, an area and reimagine the space in which you want to live in and share with your neighbors was really, really dear to us. And it wasn't only about um, creating a project or an art concept on the building, but it was also about shining a light on the community. So getting partners like Oh Miami, Pam, Young Arts Foundation involved at every level, because beyond this project, they still have programming to do year round. So for us, it was less about looking at like these, um, these large spaces, which are just as important, the parks, the pathways, but looking at the very small spaces, right? And how people can have a collective and shared experience. And so with being able to have so many different viewpoints of the intercontinental, folks from across the Bay or the Port of Miami or on the Venetian, they could just listen on their phone to the building. And if there's enough folks listening to the building at the same time, well, then we're, we're sharing part of this conversation. And maybe you go to the website and you find out that there's arts programming that's already happening in your neighborhood. And maybe you find yourself having a different kind of, kind of conversation with your neighbor.
And so, you know, this project for us really was about leveling the play playing field and creating a democratic space where the arts could be experienced through buildings and through architecture. And when I think about, you know, the work that we do here at Young Arts in terms of adaptive reuse and how we use our plaza, or even a project I have coming with Commissioner and the Knight Foundation, which looks to cultivate new and young collectors, the idea is that we want everybody here to feel like a stakeholder in their community, and the only way that people on the everyday can feel like a stakeholder in their community is if we give them the power to make the changes. And so with that, um, I've just been very fortunate to be around these inspiring folks who have helped make that possible. Thank you, Deja. Um, I, I do want to mention very quickly, um, as part of our role as Urban Impact Lab with the Public Space Challenge, um, we have the opportunity to work with every single finalist and winner. Um, finalist, at the finalist phase, we actually help anybody that has submitted a proposal to create the most competitive proposal possible. We provide technical assistance, uh, we help people think through their budgets, through, so you have that very simple beginning stage application, two questions, and then if you're selected as a finalist, you'll be asked to submit a full proposal, and um, our team is there to help you every step of the way. Um, and then we're lucky enough to continue working with the winners and help them actually implement. Um, I just wanted to mention that because as you're listening to Deja, the, I mean, her project is amazing, and it has layers, and it's, you know, it's complex. And uh, I just want you to know that you are supported as you move forward through the, through the challenge. And the Miami Foundation team is also there uh, right at your side. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, Deja mentioned um, the DDA. I sit on the board of the Downtown Development Authority. I, have, um, I, I really am honored to be here and uh, in that capacity. And Patrice Gillespie-Smith is in the back there. And I just want to point out, these are folks, Deja, Cheryl, who I will introduce in just a second, um, Patrice, even Naomi, who is in the back. Um, these are people that have done public space projects. Uh, they have led the way. Um, uh, Patrice was involved with uh, Biscayne Green that was uh, in the um, Gill's first slide at the very beginning. So there are people in this room that can help you, that can give you insight in submitting. Um, so please tap into them. They're more than, than happy to, to assist you. So with that, I get to introduce Cheryl Jacobs. Uh, Cheryl is the executive vice president of both the AIA Miami, which is the American Institute for Architects, um, as well as the Miami Center for Architecture and Design. Um, Cheryl has had over 20 years of experience um, in, le in, in, in nonprofit leadership in this community. Her network is beyond extensive. She has an exceptional uh, number of relationships um, and, and her insight is invaluable. She is also a previous Public Space Challenge winner um, and led the way the, for the creation of a document called Active Design Guidelines, um, which she may talk to you a little bit about later, and they really dovetail nicely into everything that we're talking about today. So I will turn it over to Cheryl, if you would welcome her with me. Hey, everybody. Uh, so thank you very much for asking me to participate in this. Um, I, I guess it's six years ago when uh, Miami Foundation was starting to plan, six or seven years ago, I can't remember anymore, uh, in creating this public space challenge, for some insane reason, I got asked to be involved. And I was with a, a group of, I don't even remember how many, maybe 100 people that had a, a couple of uh, sessions talking about if we did this, what would they like to see happen? And it was really an amazing experience. But the, uh, it was on a Saturday at Miami-Dade College. And, but the night before, um, they said, well, let's do a happy hour at, um, what's the name of that place that's not there anymore? Elwood's. Yeah, Elwood's. If you never had a chance to go to Elwood's, you missed, you missed a fun time. But anyway. So I walk in, I figured, okay, my office was uh, a block away, and I thought, okay, I can do this. Besides the fact that I was old enough to be the mother and or the grandmother of everyone <laughs> in that room, 
I was so inspired, and that's when I met Marta, by all of these wonderful people, and, and especially young people that wanted to make our city better. And we're developing uh, nonprofits. We're looking for ways to be involved. And it was so inspiring. I think I floated across the Venetian home uh, to Miami Beach. That Because when, when you've been doing this for a long time, and I think uh, those of you that have been around for a while, you understand this, and you feel like you're kind of banging your head against the wall. And after a while, it's too bruised and bloody. And you just kind of say, you know, I can't do this anymore. So that when you meet all of these great young people that are working to make our community better and just other people, it's really inspiring and it, it, it gets you going for that, for that next phase. And that's just a little aside. But being involved with this group, um, you know, the, the opportunities of all the different public space challenges that happen are, are amazing. And if we can take it, like Gil said, from from the ideas to the, the implementation is where we have to keep uh, fighting. So I had this idea. We, we, uh, our center for architecture has been at the old post office building downtown. We <clears throat> recently had to vacate that. You can see me later. I can talk to you about that. But anyway, it, it's, it was the first post office built in uh, Miami, the first public building, actually. It's on the National Register. It is protected locally, so it will not go away. It will just have another life now. But there are steps in the front. And I, I'm a real, I love music. And I'm a real believer in having music in cities that you just walk by and it's there. I mean, anybody that's ever been to New Orleans or Seattle even, or Portland, or you know, every other block there's uh, some music. And I thought it would be really exciting to create a program on the steps of our building that uh, uh, would uh, just have, you know, just the band jamming, whoever, whoever it was. We had a lot of different kinds of groups. And that was my idea for, uh, for Lively Step. So I just wanted to show you, uh, sometimes the weather got a little funky, so we had to go inside. Um, we had all kinds of different groups, and people would just walk by. Sometimes we had an event, a uh, happy hour that was uh, part of it. And um, sometimes, it, you know, people would just stop when they'd see it. We did it late afternoon. And that street, uh, Northeast First Avenue and First Street, doesn't have a lot of pedestrian activity even now. But when we first did this, we really thought it was going to actually have more, that more of these buildings were going to be filled, and that just uh, hasn't happened. They're still actually kind of empty now. It's a an uh, area that really needs uh, some work. But I also hope that I would inspire other businesses and buildings to maybe do this um, in different areas of downtown. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but I will not give up. And uh, those of you that know Buskerfest, uh, the, you know, that's a big event once a year, but we work with them. And I'm hoping in our new space that we'll be able to do some of this, um, this kinds of stuff. And it just, it makes your walking better. It makes your, your, your experience in your city uh, better. Uh, you were talking about walking, Gil. Uh, when you work downtown, unless you have something wrong in the head, you walk a lot. Because to drive like six blocks to go someplace takes longer to find a parking spot. And we walk all over downtown. And wouldn't it be great if there was music on a regular basis, like, you know, in different... The guy that, I don't know how many of you are downtown, but there was a guy that uh, did this amazing... He was drumming on paint cans. I don't know if you remember him, for any of you who have been downtown. He's gone now. <clears throat> and actually, I. I I think he's in Portland because I saw a guy that looked just like him when I was in Portland last year. So, hmm. But we used to have a little bit more, and the city is, uh, unfortunately, is not real supportive of that kind of thing. So we're still working to try and, and get more of that. Um, so that was our public space uh, challenge. And then we were asked in last year when we did the um, 
different an event for the 50th anniversary uh, to bring that back, and and we did, and uh, it was a great um, event for us, and everybody really enjoyed it. So hopefully, we'll be able to do more of that, even though the grant is over. I'm I'm keeping the concept and the idea, and hopefully, we'll can uh, continue to do uh, more of that. And I think I have another. Yeah, so this was just um, the actual invitation for the, the reboot. And, um, you know, some of the participation that we had with uh, other events. But now I'm bringing you the idea. I'm connecting a little bit to Active Design Miami because that uh, talks to uh, the kinds of things that uh, Gil was talking about. <clears throat> Active Design Miami is a project that was funded uh, for us uh, by the CDC through the Department of Health. And we created, with Marta's help, Marta uh, worked with us on that, 69 evidence-based strategies that help um, architects, planners, uh, designers, uh, municipalities to develop public spaces and buildings and transit and transportation in uh, ways that allow uh, people to be healthier and to have healthier um, uh, outcome. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more and any information that you'd like to have about this. I am, I have right here, I brought a gift for Gil, but we have the strategies right here and I'm happy to share any of that uh, with you. And uh, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and it's been it's been a wonderful experience working on all of these projects um, with Cheryl and and with so many of you. Um, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, we're getting close to the end, so I think that with my panelists' permission, we are going to uh, ask if anybody in the audience has any questions, um, anything that you want to talk about. If if you have questions, we'll take them now. Um, if not, you could see us. We'll linger around for a few minutes afterwards, um, and we can chat. Any question, Patrice? <laughs> Any other questions? Question. Um, the deadline for the public space challenge is May 3rd. Uh, the challenge closes at exactly 11.59 p.m. Please don't wait till 11.58 p.m. to submit. Uh, there's nobody can help you in the middle of the night <laughs> if that site crashes. So, but the deadline is May 3rd. Absolutely. Um, so Gil, if actually, if we could just wrap up with this question, this question is for you. <laughs> Sorry, Gil. Um, and, and, we'll, and we'll wrap up with this. Um, uh, the lady is asking, how do we encourage government? So, and, and, and clearly your message was, it has to happen, we have to move forward. But do you have any recommendation, or even one recommendation, on really pushing government to move beyond excuses? Yeah, two, two comments. One is regarding the challenge. Don't try to be original on everything. Adapt and improve. Don't copy and paste like we do on the computers, but adapt and improve, that's fine. You know, one of the things that sometimes we forget is that in, in government, we need to be more generous. We need to help other cities, and other cities can help us. We need to help other NGOs, and other NGOs can help us. In, that doesn't happen in the private sector, because if I'm the marketing manager of a shampoo, and I have 20% of the market, for me to go from 20 to 21, someone to increase 1%, someone has to decrease 1% but not in the public sector. If you saw something really cool that is taking place in New York, or in New Orleans, or in Paris, or in Bogota, or whatever, grab the idea, adapt it, improve it. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to start from scratch. 
Actually, it might be more successful. If someone has already done it, people might have done it and might have failed and might have redone it and have failed and have tweaked it and whatever. So if someone can do it, that can be perfect. So, so don't, 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 don't think that only ultra original. No, the adaptation, whatever is original, but the other, no. And, and that is how we can also learn. If we have done something good, if one of the neighborhoods in Miami Dade is doing something really good for older adults. I remember when I was commissioner, I started organizing some co thing that is called viejotecas. It's like discotheque, but for old people. Very, very, very successful. Only for people at that time was 55 and over. And now it's like 60 and over but very successful. So if someone is doing it, let's go and find out what is it that they are doing. Same, same. So, so I, I love it. And I love your project on the building on the Intercontinental. I think that is so cool and having the possibility of listening to the music in different So I think this is great. But now to the second question, government. We need to get them moving. We need to get them moving. Part of it is maybe with the high school students doing demonstrations. Maybe that's what it will take. Whatever it takes, we need to move. Something that we could help, say, email them, be part of the conversation. Any time that they are talking about sidewalks or trees or parks or public space or whatever, be at the table. Because if you are not at the table, you're going to be on the menu. <laughs> and you don't want to be on the menu. They say, oh, what happened with that public space? Now it's a building. Did you go to the public meetings? Did you send the emails? For example, will you send emails to the media? Get in contact with the media. The politicians, unfortunately, most are terrified of the media. So the media becomes very, very powerful. But if you send a letter to the media and it has one signature, they won't publish it. Get 10 friends to sign up for, with you and then I would guarantee nine out of 10 times it's gonna be published. Same thing, when you send letters to the mayor, don't send it with one signature, send it with 10, and then he will even call you up. But if it's what, so some of these things. Also, uh, let, take a look at what is important to them. I wrote an article for the European Cycling Federation that said if you wanna promote cycling, don't talk about cycling. Cycling is very polarizing. So talk about public health. Talk about the environment, talk about economic development, whatever matters to specific. You go to the commissioners, and there might be six commissioners in Miami. Each one has different interests. To one of them might be the environment. So say, oh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had less noise on the street and we had better uh, uh, quality of air? And say, oh, by the way, this city promoted bicycling, and it's improved. But the next, council, next commissioner doesn't care about the environment. I care about economic development. So tell them how that is going to improve development. And the next one might be public health. And the next one might be something else. So let's analyze what it is. I think with the elected officials, more than anything, you got to hit them in the heart. Most people are thinking of the numbers. We got to do a study and feasibility. And... Don't worry about that. That's not the issue. Maybe they will tell you. You say, oh, I got, I got this story, I want to do this, I want to do this pro uh, open streets in Miami, and we're going to, oh, you got to come the numbers, and they up. No, make sure that they have it in their heart. Now get them on the plane, New York, Jam Amanda Burden, the Commissioner of Planning, Janet Sarikan, the Commissioner of Transportation, they got on a plane Friday night, they went to Bogota, Saturday, talk, 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 Sunday, up and down on a bike, they come back, and they loved it. The next week, they met with the New York Times and they said, we're gonna do it. Three months later, they, they done it. So get those politicians on a plane if you want the open streets, go to Bogota, go to Guadalajara. Guadalajara is fantastic. Uh, and then they will do it. But get them, you, you gotta convince them of whatever you're doing, whether it's art or music or sidewalks or bikeways or whatever. So I think focus more on the benefit the walking or the cycling or is the means, is not the end. Think what is important to each one. Maybe one is uh, very concerned about uh, mental health because her father or mother is having Alzheimer or whatever, then focus why having nature reduces anxiety and depression. So talk about that the, the, and, then, and then talk about the planting of the trees. So the trees is, are the means to something else. So I would say that that is something. But the last thing, do a, get, get a broad alliance. Get some good partners, public health. So maybe you're gonna talk about walkability in the city and you think, oh, I'm gonna go to the uh, uh, transportation department. No, maybe you might be more successful if you go to public health. If you get the public health officer becoming the champion of walkability in Miami, 
and speaking in the media and in the newspapers and whatever, it might be better. So get in the, get, get, you don't know exactly which one is gonna be your partner, and you can pitch the project through different departments, make sure that you have the one, the one that is most likely to score the goals. Uh, and there are many, many activities. I think Miami is doing some things good. Not great. <laughs> but, uh, but then we need champions like you to score the goals. In many, in some areas you, are you have learned, I'm gonna end with this analogy. It's like you are having playing a soccer game. In many of these topics, Miami 20 years ago was not even on the field, was way out of the stadium. Now you are on the field, you are passing the ball around. But remember that if the ball doesn't cross the line, you'll score goals. So we need some of you to become champions. And the challenge is about that, it's about becoming a champion, it's about hitting the ball across the line. If we don't score the goal, we, we're not gonna win the game. So it's not just passing the ball around, but scoring goals. So good luck. That's a, that's a wonderful analogy, thank you. Um, everything that Gil has mentioned really encap encapsulates why the Miami Foundation invests so much time and resources, because public spaces touch so many aspects of our lives, and they can have important impacts on our health, on a creative uh, world and our creative experiences, um, on our environment, and, and so much more. Publicspacechallenge.org, you will find information on workshops, you will find information on how to contact anybody for help, you'll find information on how to, um, how to submit. We have a webinar tomorrow at noon. You can find that information on pub at publicspacechallenge.org as well. Thank you so much for being here. Please join me in a one more quick round of applause for Gail, Deja, and Cheryl. And thank you for everybody that made this possible. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>